Now, Monitor brings you Meet the Press, the prize-winning interview program produced by Lawrence E. Spivak. Ready for the spontaneous unrehearsed conference are four of America's top news reporters. Their questions do not necessarily reflect their point of view, but may be their way of getting a story for you. Now, here's the moderator of Meet the Press, Ned Brooks. Welcome once again to Meet the Press. Our guest is Mr. V.K. Krishnamenon, the Minister of Defense of India and India's Chief Delegate to the United Nations. Mr. Krishnamenon returns to the U.N. Assembly at a time when new disturbances are occupying world attention. Hostilities in the Kingdom of Laos, the anti-communist uprising in Tibet, and the border clashes between communist China and India. Again this year, Mr. Krishnamenon was one of the leaders in the move to admit communist China to the U.N. It was defeated in the steering committee. Mr. Krishnamenon was a leader of India's fight for independence. When the fight was won, he organized diplomatic relations with the European governments, and he became the first high commissioner to the United Kingdom. He has long played an active role in United Nations affairs. He is a lawyer, author, and journalist, as well as a roving ambassador. And now seated around the press table, ready to interview Mr. Krishnamenon, are Ernest K. Lindley of Newsweek magazine, Pauline Frederick of NBC News, Eric Britter of the London Times, and Lawrence E. Spivak, our regular member of the Meet the Press panel. Now, Mr. Minister, if you're ready, we'll start the questions with Mr. Spivak. Now, Mr. Minister, Premier Zhou Enlai charged that Indian troops invaded Chinese territory at 11 points. As Defense Minister, you know what your troops have done and have not done. As far as you know, have any Indian troops taken offensive action, military offensive, military action, against the Chinese Communist forces? Mr. Spivak, may, may I say at the outset, I'm very glad to be with all of you again and come on your program. Now, with regard to this question, first of all, Indian troops, in the sense of the Indian Armed Forces, have not been on the frontier until very recently, I mean, they have not been in charge of their particular operations, which is done by constabulary and police. So we have recently taken it over. But apart from this uh, subtle difference, there is no question of any armed force of India, police or military, going outside our territory. It's quite possible, it's quite true, the Chinese regard our territory as theirs. That's a different question. <laughs> Mr. Minister, is there in your mind any reasonable explanation or justification for the Chinese communist attack on India? How can I say there will be any justification for anyone attacking us? But uh, what is in their mind, I cannot tell you. All I can say is highly regrettable. Uh, it is an unwise, I would like to call it policy, set of actions, or what has culminated set of actions on the part of the Chinese government. It has done them no good, it has done us no good, it has done the world no good. And I hope that uh, this chapter will be ended as soon as possible. For a long time, you were one of the world leaders who believed in the peaceful intentions of the Chinese communist regime. Do you still? <clears throat> well, our view has not been the peaceful intentions of any particular people, but that you have to live in this world peacefully. And even if there are difficulties, we must find peaceful solutions. And as the Prime Minister said in Parliament, we have to follow a dual policy. On the one hand, we will not permit, so far as our capacity allows, anyone, it's not a question of who comes, but the fact of coming, to come into our territory. And we will resist it, or take such action as required. On the other, um, if there are difficulties, they must be resolved by negotiation, it's sort to of be resolved by negotiation. There seems, however, to be a pattern of, of uh, military action on the part of the Chinese communists in Southeast Asia, not merely the attack on, on Laos and India, but what happened in Tibet. Uh, does that to you indicate uh, peaceful intentions on the part of the Chinese communist government? Uh, it's very difficult to subscribe to the whole of that proposition because these are separate issues. But uh, with, regard to the, with regard to the 
entry of Chinese elements into our territory and in regard to the policies followed in Tibet, there's certainly use of force. That is to say, the dependence upon force as the arbiter of difficulties. But these are separate problems. Coming into our country is aggression. Um, what they do in Tibet is deplorable. We have got our own views about it. But that is the following of a policy which we approve of ethically, we disapprove of ethically and morally in regard to people in their state. That's a different question. But, but with regard to laws, we'll talk about it afterwards. Yes. But, but have their actions in any way altered your opinion of the danger they pose for other Asiatic countries? I mean, is there a pattern of operation of aggression, not just against India and Laos and Tibet? The government of India does not want to jump to conclusions in this matter. They, they do not want uh, to regard incidents or, or occurrences that have taken place as a kind of um, preamble to war or anything of that character. We do not want to create a war psychosis, uh, nor do we want to exaggerate even. But at the same time, we want the Chinese to know, we want the world to know that we will neither be intimidated nor will be walked upon. Mr. Britter. So you were quoted the other day as saying in London that uh, you regarded the situation on the border as serious but not alarming, and that uh, you would defend the country to the best of your ability. That's right. May I know, does this mean that you would be, you would either expect or invite or be willing to accept military aid from any other countries, and if so, from what countries? I don't think the problem arises at the present moment. There is a great deal of um, lack of knowledge, quite understandably, even we are in the same position with regard to this terrain, with regard to this, it's not a war of positions. We are in mountain terrain, where for us to go from one post to another, about 15 or 16 miles, it takes us four, four, four four and a half days. So it, it is not a war of positions. We are not uh, building a Maginot line or anything of that character. And um, the territory is disputed so far they're concerned. So far we're concerned, it's not disputed, do you see? And um, no question of any outside assistance, we can, we can protect our country. Do you mean, during this present session of the, of the General Assembly, do you think you'll, you'll make it your effort to gain friends and influence people by your policy so as to be sure that in case of emergency you have the whole world behind you if Chinese aggression gets too active? Uh, well, uh, it's difficult to answer the question the way you put it because we have thought, we may be wrong, that our policies have, all, have always been such as to gain friends even if they did not approve of it for the time being. I think one way of gaining friends is to be honest, even if the policy is not approved. Um, but if you are que the meaning of a question is this, does it mean a change in India's foreign policy and approach? The Prime Minister answered in Parliament, it doesn't. Mr. Frederick. The fundamentals of our policy will not change, are not changed. Mr. Krishnamanan, does your government have any firm uh, Ag agreement or offer from the Chinese communists as to negotiation of the difficulties on your border? Well, we have nothing secret. They're all published. The last letter, Chu and Lai, also mentions that matters must be discussed by, uh, settled by negotiation and so on. But there are elements in that letter which we disapprove of. There will be no negotiations on the basis of large parts of India being already surrendered to the Chinese. We certainly would be willing to negotiate about um, adjustment of boundaries, how they are to be protected, and this and that and the other. That um, he has said these matters must be settled by negotiations of a way. But you don't have a firm basis for negotiation as yet. Yeah, we have asked them. We have asked them what procedures may be adopted. But um, the other firm base is things are quieter since then. Now, Mr. Khrushchev has, uh, for the first time, asked that uh, a difference between a communist state and a non-communist state be settled peaceably in his appeal before he came over here for uh, Red China and India to settle their differences. Do you have any uh, feeling that when Mr. Khrushchev goes to Peking that he will in some way intercede so as to bring about peaceful negotiations between your country and Red China? I noticed that, in fact, uh, uh, when I spoke in Bombay the day I was leaving, I said for the first time 
In 42 years after the Russian Revolution, Russia had come out to speak about peaceful settlement as being a communist and non-communist um, parties. Uh, we have no offers of mediation, and uh, we think it's a matter which Chinese and we should settle. Do you feel that Mr. Khrushchev... We don't turn down anything else. Do you believe Mr. Khrushchev is going to stop in New Delhi, either going to Peking or returning from... We have no information. Would you like to have Mr. Khrushchev uh, do some, uh, uh, take up your case in uh, Peking? No, we, we would always like to see Mr. Khrushchev in, in Delhi or anyone else who wishes to come or who would like to come. But there's no question in this matter of um, the Russians entering into mediate. So far I know. Of course, developments may take place hereafter. Would your prime minister be willing to go to Peking to have a, a meeting with his equivalent in the, in the uh, Chinese government on the differences? There, there are no such proposals at present. I mean, if there is a desire and there are all the circumstances of an agreement, it's not a question of the prime minister going. There are proper established channels. But Would of he course, be willing if, to it, go? if that is part of the ingredients of a settlement, naturally the prime minister always said he'll go to the ends of the earth for the peace, for peace. So he'd be willing to go? No, I didn't say that. that uh, what I said was the circumstances should be such that a peaceful settlement requires only that particular ingredient. My prime minister will not refuse to take that step. But my prime minister is not going about begging anywhere for making peace. There are two parties to this. We have got to settle, first of all, whether they're going to negotiate, on what basis and what procedures will be followed. But there will be no unnecessary bellicosity from our side. Equally, there will be no sub 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 subservience. Mr. Lindley. Uh, we know, Mr. Minister, that you and your government favor the seating of Red China in the United Nations. Your proposal was uh, overruled, so to speak, by the steering committee of the General Assembly. Are you going to make a vigorous effort to uh, reverse that steering committee decision and push the question of admitting Red China at this session? What has happened is not a new experience. I suppose the purpose of the question is whether, in view of recent incidents, there is a fundamental change in our policy. And the answer is no, because we put down this item after these things had taken place. And uh, if there are difficulties between China and their neighbors, it only shows uh, that um, if she were here, then settlements, arguments are more, more possible than otherwise. Our arguments about uh, China being properly represented does not depend upon our sentimental relations or anything uh, due to world causes. Well, Mr. Minister, you uh, spoke of the incursions into India as being aggressive acts, even though they may be limited. And your right. prime minister has said, and I quote from his speech of September 12th, what we have to face today is a great and a powerful nation which is aggressive. He also spoke of seeing paranoia in the situation. Would you uh, subscribe to those statements? I haven't seen those statements, but there certainly are acts of incursion. I myself said so. And as I said, it is not a question of who comes into our territory. It's the yeah. fact of coming that we shall resist. Well, it doesn't matter whether the Chinese or communists or anybody else. But you feel that an aggressor, one who's now indulging in acts of aggression, should be admitted to the United Nations. The fact that a country commits an act, an act which other, which the other party regards aggression or even proves aggression is not conclusive against seating. In that case, there will be so many nations who cannot sit there. Well, do you think the fact that the Soviet Union was a member of the United Nations had any appreciable effect on its behavior in uh, the case of Hungary? I, I don't know about any particular cases. I think that without the Soviet Union, well, there will be no United Nations. And similarly, we say China is a large country with 600 million people, and you can't just wish it away. It ought to be here. But you've been talking in a friendly way to the Chinese. You yourself uh, oh, we shall many continue, missions we shall continue there. continue to talk friendly in a friendly I way. I recall the Bandung Conference four years ago when Mr. Nehru, with your able assistance, introduced Zhou Enlai to polite society in uh, Asia and Africa. And uh, there was a great deal of talk then about the spirit of Bandung and reliance on the pledged word of Beijing. Do you think you can rely on their word? Well, 
we always, there have been many instances in the world where uh, there have been difference of opinion, there have been even wars, that, for example, don't you ask for the inclusion of Germany in the United Nations? Is not Italy in the United Nations, not Japan in the United Nations? When if, um, shall we say, this day, uh, ten years ago, if anyone had said Japan should be in the United Nations, he would have regarded that as a spectacle. The United Nations is founded for the purpose of getting all the nations in. But, uh, Mr. Minister, doesn't the behavior of China involve not only aggression against you, but violation of its public pledges, both with respect to Tibet and with respect to its, uh, its personal assurances to uh, your government about uh, the McMahon line? I said that uh, no occurrence of this kind can alter our policy, hmm. that the United Nations should, be, unless in a state of war, should be an organization of all nations in the world, representing the world as it is. No doubt, if there are uh, the, the presence of China in the United Nations, will be a factor which assists towards peace, even if she is unpeaceful. Mr. Spivak. Mr. Minister, have you any assurance that Communist China would uh, welcome an invitation to come into the UN, even if they were asked? Well, they have applied so many times, and they have not retracted their application. Have they, have they uh, actually applied? That is China. Oh, yes, they did, two or three years ago, I believe. Not this year, I don't know. Uh, but uh, that, 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 isn't, uh, that isn't the issue. The issue is not favoring China or unfavoring China. The issue is trying to a world organization that meets the purposes of the Charter, that has some hopes of... of representing the world as it is, and provide some machinery, some opportunity for the resolving of difficulties of this kind. Yes, but it always takes two in a case of that kind. As I remember it, Great Britain has recognized Communist China, and they haven't yet sent an ambassador. Would the, uh, isn't there a danger that uh, you might now invite her, even if, uh, uh, if, if, if what you want to... Uh, comes to pass and they just refuse to join? Have you well, any assurance? What will, what will happen in the future with China or any other country is more than I can say. But as, as we see it, the right step is that China should be properly represented in the United Nations. You've had no assurance from the Chinese communists that they would accept? Any. We were not asked yeah. for any. May I ask you this question? Yeah, we, are not, uh, we don't hold a brief from China. We hold a brief from ourselves and the purposes of the Charter. It is a misunderstanding of the situation. Our action does not pursue, I mean, does not issue, ensue from uh, a particular friendliness or otherwise with China. After all, what did we do? We asked the Americans, for example, uh, to accept China in the United Nations, and the United States a friendly country to us. Then if we can ask them to accept China when they believed that aggression has been committed against them or against their forces, that was moral then we should do the same thing in regard to us. It would be highly immoral for us taking other position. Uh, Mr. Minister, uh, I'd like to take you to Tibet for a minute. In view of what India knows regarding the brutalities in Tibet by the Chinese communists, why has the Indian government refused to sponsor or support the Dalai Lama in taking his country's case to the UN? The government of India has definitely said it will not support the, disc uh, the bringing in a Tibetan item on the agenda of the United Nations, certainly those things are present for these reasons. First of all, there are constitutional difficulties. We recognize Tibet as part of the Chinese state, both historically from British times and also by our agreement with China in 1954. Second, uh, as I think it was Selvin Lloyd who said yesterday, we have been saying this for a very long time, the only purpose of bringing items on the agenda he is in the hope that's going to lead to something. And we do not think either Tibet or Dalai Lama or anyone will be assisted by the argument of the United Nations. Our views on Tibet, or rather our views in regard to occurrences, our attitude towards those who come away from Tibet, that we have provided asylum and so on, is well known. That is not altered by it. Well, has India a better approach to that? Uh, problem than bringing it before world opinion in the United Nations, which obviously had been set up for that very purpose. Well, Mr. Spivak, you know us in the government of India's view so well that if we thought 
it was either wise or desirable or correct to do, we would have done so. But the question is not, is it wise from your point of view, but isn't it wise from the point of view of the world to have the brutalities of Tibet debated in the United Nations and have the Chinese communists brought to the bar of public opinion on I, this issue? I did, not, I did not only use one epithet. I said wise as one of them. There are other things also to be considered. There is not the slightest uh, objection, and it may be even desirable for people to air their views on this question on such occasions are presented by the United Nations. But um, that is not always exhausted by placing an item on the agenda. That is up to each delegation to use its own uh, initiative in the matter. But you are asking me why we do not support or sponsor the Tibetan item on the agenda. We do not think it's wise, we do not think it's constitutional, we do not think it will lead to any good results. And what is more, it will involve our breaking a treaty obligation. Mr. We signed a treaty in 1954, five years ago. We have not denounced it yet. Yes, but you signed a treaty, you mean with Chinese, communist China? No, no, we signed a treaty which recognized Tibet as part of the Chinese state. But you also have a, a peace treaty with communist China, I would assume, and they have, they have already committed aggression against you. No, we have no peace treaty with China. We have the only, the only agreement we have with China in terms is this agreement in regard to Tibet. Oh. Mr. Britter. Sir, so last Friday... That is my recollection. Yeah. Last Friday, Mr. Khrushchev told the United Nations that Russia favored total disarmament of all countries within four years. He said nothing about effective controls or inspection. Now, as Defense Minister of India, do you regard that proposal as a, a serious or practical contribution to disarmament? Uh, Mr. Britter, you wouldn't expect me three or four days after a speech is this kind is made in the two minutes or something that's left to argue this question. But I would welcome, and my government would welcome, this whole vision of a warless world whether it be four years or 40 years or two years, a warless world where private armies would be regarded as, as much undesirable as individuals of private arms in society. But this, uh, this uh, plan cannot stand alone. Indeed, even Mr. Khrushchev does not say it can stand alone. It is visionary, isn't it? No, I, all, all things that have achieved are visionary. Well, there's a practical approach too, isn't there? No, a vision is practical. You can't practice anything without vision. Well, controls and inspection are the practical yes, aspect. Uh, that is the aspect which makes the vision practical, or rather major, Im implements the vision, so to say. And if, if, as against China, for instance, what sort of guarantee or assurance would you want? Uh, that now you're China getting hoisted on your own. Now you're getting hoisted on your own, on your own petard. Before you here. yourself agree uh, to Therefore, reduce... you have to have China here. Well, what you can't have it both ways. That's one of the reasons. Uh, Mr. Krishnamanan, you said a moment ago that India's fundamental policy with regard to representation of Red China in the UN had not changed, but apparently the enthusiasm in your country has changed. Today's press says that not a single New Delhi newspaper seemed to regret the fact that the steering committee of the UN voted down your request to have Red China represented. Well, I'm not willing to, I'm not going to argue whether there is regret or otherwise. Uh, I can tell you that we do not put down these items either merely as a matter of form or because we're afraid of anybody. We believe that the presence of China in the United Nations is essential, for example, for the problem of disarmament. We do not, we, it is, even from a selfish point of view, we do not want a huge, a very powerful and very populous neighbor on our frontiers who is outside the community of nations. It is, not, it is not, our, not our good health to be so, even from a purely selfish point of view. But you have diplomatic relations with them and can deal with them. Why do you have to bring them to the United Nations? Then why Nations? have the United Nations at all? We have dip diplomatic relations with every other country in the world. But this is a particular case as far as India is concerned. Not necessarily, because a country has done... So. There are other countries who have done things against us, you know, who are in the United Nations. Now, you said a while ago as I understood it, that uh, Red China's action against India was aggression, but Tibet was an un another story. Why is that another story? Because in the case of India, 
there is definite active aggression against our sovereignty. That is one country committing an active incursion or aggression against another. In the other case, there is an act, if you like, of cruelty or repression or of unethical conduct or whatever you like to call it. But from the, from the point of view of India's relation to China as established by law, Tibet is part of the Chinese state. The Prime Minister so stated in Parliament and for the whole world to know. And that is why, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why we are not sponsoring this item. On the other hand, the humanitarian other considerations are responsible for our giving hospitality to the refugees. Mr. Mr. Lindley. Minister, you have uh, done something to strengthen the armed forces of India during your period as Minister of Defense, have I you didn't not? Hear what you, said. you have strengthened the armed forces of India, at least with new equipment, since you've been uh, Minister of Defense. Well, I think that's the wrong way to put it, if I may say so. I hope everything in India is stronger uh, than it was last time. It's your economic progress, your industrial progress, your political progress. And if you have an army, you equip it as best as you can. Otherwise, a waste of money. Well, uh, naturally. Uh, but if you should be mistaken <clears throat> about the Chinese communist behavior, and this should prove not to be a limited thing, but are you strong enough to cope with... Mr. Lending, I'm afraid that I'm not even going to be able to let you finish your question. Our time seems to be running out. 